Hi. Hi, everybody. I'm overwhelmed to see this many people's faces and names in some cases. If you're, you don't have your camera on, it's, it's kind of like being um, in a theater, weirdly, and it's beautiful. So thank you so much. Thank you for watching our show and caring to come to the, the chat tonight. Really appreciate it. And there, there, there isn't, I mean, all my years in the theater, there isn't a formula that works for, for talks. Um, they connect to the show itself and they connect to people's feelings about the show and the artists in every talk back always want to hear what you think. So Zoom makes this a little bit difficult that you got to type, um, but you can also raise your hand, Stuart just said, I think. So please feel free to raise your hand and unmute and we'll answer any question you want. I want the artists to talk, especially Joe, especially Susan, especially, you know, all of them. But um, really, I know we all want to, we want responses from you, emotional responses, especially. Theater is like about, you know, feeling more than anything else. So here we are, we have an opportunity. Please share with us. <laughs> Start somebody, <laughs> if you will. So Carla, I have a first question from somebody who was kind of curious, had like a process question and wanted to know how, how this thing was made. And they asked, uh, Charles Dank asked, uh, was there a set division of responsibility between the directors? How did you guys co-direct this show? Joe. <laughs> well, um, in a sense there was because um, my area of um, experience has more to do with being behind a camera and Carla's uh, um, experience working in theater. And so I, I, they sort of broke down along those lines. I mean, we could kind of approach whatever the task was um, from those points of view. And as we got further into it, we were able to really merge um, our, our points of view and work um, pretty seamlessly, I think, in terms of um, moving forward and getting what we needed to get done in these rather short days that we had because of these COVID protocols. Um, we were working essentially in production five hours, about five hours a day. Yeah, we'll just add that we have a long relationship. We've made things that we're very proud of together leading up to this point, but we had never done this. I've never been involved in a film like this as, as a co-director and uh, I think our, you know, our long uh, collaboration really helped, but it was also super cool to be in a learning circumstance. I'd say for Joe having to do with the strange uh, time schedule, right? It, it wasn't like a normal film, I'm, I'm sure, in its compression. And the co COVID just is a, an opportunity, isn't it, everyone? to do things differently and to explore things you do not know. Yeah, I mean, for me too, it was a, a, a big learning curve because um, what I've mainly done in my professional life is documentary film work. So uh, working in, in a, a dramatic film environment was uh, to some extent new for me. I cut my teeth making uh, short films for Mr. Rogers of the McFeelys going and doing different things. And I, I learned how to do some um, basic blocking and how you sort of break down a scene and that kind of thing. But we were, uh, it was a, a big learning curve for both of us. But as Carla said, there was a lot of trust um, going into And look, it. look who we were surrounded with. <laughs> really? Yeah. So um, I have both a comment and a question. Oh, go ahead. Uh, hi, I'm Cotter. Um, I, as I wrote to you, and I will now say to everyone, I was most affected by the raw courage of all of you to, to go to this place and to do it obviously without an audience. As an actor, I'm fascinated to hear you speak 
about what it was like to create this in a, not in a vacuum, obviously, but in a private home, really. Um, it was emotionally um, really um, upsetting in a, in a beautiful way, if that makes sense to you. And I really applaud your talent and your bravery and everything you gave to us. But I would love to hear you talk a little bit about what it was like to, to be in this world. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Cotter. Hi, Ingrid. Um, in some ways it was easier. Ah. It, we worked together and I will also say at some point I said to Andrew, I think this is so easy with you because of the work we've done with Cotter. <laughs> um, there was a fluidity to it. Um, Carla and Joe and Mark filming were so respectful. I mean, of whatever process we had. But I think most, I think all three of us, guys help me here. I know I came in with the lines pretty much learned. Now, what was interesting, we took in some cases a very different slant on what I had thought they would be when I was learning them. And I think some of the challenge was being flexible enough to go, oh, well, I obviously didn't understand that. Mm -hmm. And then throwing whatever idea you had out the window and moving forward. But it was like a wonderful, wonderful rehearsal all the time. And then they started filming it and, but it was still loose enough. There wasn't a rigidity or we were allowed to play it. However, mm -hmm. it came up. I'm jealous. That, that run through, there was a looseness to it, which was just wonderful. And which I haven't always experienced in film work. It shows, it, it really shows. Yeah. Guys, you wanna say anything? Uh, I'll, I'll just quickly add, uh, there was a lot of trust. <laughs> uh, I, I do think uh, this piece is more of a of a director's piece, right? There's a there's a particular story to be told, and I, I know I saw I saw your head, Carla. But in the mm -hmm. sense that I didn't, we didn't have the audience to react, right? To give us that feedback, um, and so for me, it was a, just a tremendous amount of trust in uh, Carla and Joe and Susan and and Ingrid, you and Andrew, everyone who was a part and there. Um, and especially since that first scene, I felt like I, I was <laughs> swimming and I was going, I was going, is it this stroke? And uh, it was really, it was really fascinating to be in that environment. And I also want to offer that I didn't realize until, I'm getting emotional right now, <laughs> until it was done. And I didn't have anyone to share it with. Yes. Yeah. What theater means to me. And so having these bodies right here on my screen, um, actually I'm incredibly grateful. There's a community of people that I know and that I don't know, but are coming together for a, a common love and curiosity um, uh, and, and uh, collaboration and community. So uh, thank you for that. Yeah, and I'll just, I'll just tag on to that. I mean, it was, the whole thing was filmed, I mean, like a film. So part one was week one, part two was week two, part three was week three. So I wasn't in part one, but I showed up for part two and it's like my week was, it was great. It was like popcorn. It was all those just bite-sized pieces everywhere. You know, the shots were nice, were short, right? And manageable and, 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 and had this sort of light quality. And I was like, this is great. I went home feeling so good and then, and then week three came around. Yeah. 
Um, and it like, you know, there's no stopping. It's a full on all the way through kind of thing, right? And so it was, it, it, it was kind of, you know, you, you dive into the texture that it is. Um, and that was very much reflected um, in the experience of it, for sure. And the, the sheer joy of getting to take the car, the instrument out on the road and get it to go up to speed. I'm so used to doing, hi, how are you? St you know what I mean, trivial, silly. This, I got to choose scenery and my scene partners and it was really fun. Yeah, I showed up for first day of the third part, first day of rehearsal, and I had all my lines memorized, and Ingrid had her lines memorized, and so we just sort of met, sort of ten minutes before rehearsal began, and we started doing it, and it was, it was the most incredible experience because I was so off book, and so was she, and so we could just engage in this authentic sort of first time experience that is very much like you know film, where it's got that sort of immediacy to it. So that's when I was like, oh, this is. This is gonna be fun. This is fun. That's great. Um, we have a couple of questions in the chat. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna start there and then Donald, I see you have your hand raised. So I'll come back for you uh, as well in a second. So uh, film question here from, uh, I think for Joe and maybe for Mark, where was the establishing shot taken? All those establishing shots, you know, that, that kind of led us into each part of uh, the film. Well, um... Uh, for the most part, th 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 these were, um, this was imagery that I uh, got um, using my drone camera. Um, and um, I have a friend who has a farm out in Somerset, and I had this idea of how this thing should begin where we see, you know, far away. So there's a city that's far away, and we go into this kind of mysterious house. And um, uh, so I, I should. I shot that and um, put, you know, added a few elements to it, the clouds, the city in the background, the light in the window, that kind of thing. Made it day for, you know, made it night. Um, and uh, so that's essentially where they came from. We didn't want it to be identified as, uh, okay, Western Pennsylvania, although that opening shot really does evoke, um, you know, Western Pennsylvania, but a lot of other places too. But that's, that's where they came from. Donald, um, do you wanna go ahead and ask your question? Okay, it's actually, uh, I've always, Octavius. Um, away. So when, when you were making the hats, designing the hats, uh, is there anything that inspired you while making the hats? And if so, like what did, what was, what inspired you to inspire? I have a fun story about about half of the hats where we put a call out to milliners and theater people in Pittsburgh and around the country uh, to see if during this COVID time they'd be willing to join us on a kind of wild ride. And so for a group of 10 milliners uh, who then um, got some of their friends into the act too, um, we talked, I showed them my research, um, which is uh, from all over the place about the actors and about uh, a, kind of the emotional quality of uh, the piece. And then talked about Carol Churchill's indication that the hats are big and outrageous. Um, and uh, then I, I wanted to have hands off. I wanted everybody to go to their most creative place without me, uh, you know, micromanaging it because I thought they would be more creative and, and free to express. So um, that's, uh, that's about, you know, uh, nearly half of the hats, I guess. We had a couple uh, of uh, professional uh, milliner drapers who worked on some of them and we took some inspiration from uh, an artist and from another designer um, and uh, all kinds of uh, research pictures that we had.
a couple more questions. In the I, chat. I just want to I just want to oh, piggyback on that, Stuart, for one second. And then the the day came when into our our safe set in the the warehouse where we built the show, these amazing creations arrived. It was just unbelievable, and um, a very small number of people wore them, who were miraculously filmed by Joe and Mark to seem as if we were many, many people. I was one, Stuart was one, Jelena was one. I'm not sure if the other couple beautiful people who were volunteers to wear the other ones are on the Zoom or not, but we were a tiny number of people. And Susan miraculously made us look different. And on one night, you know, we filmed that, that sequence that became what Joe made in terms of the hat parade. Richard says he wishes the hat parade is longer and he loved your Hitchcock cameo. <laughs> um, John, I see your hand raised. I'm gonna go through the chat questions first and I'll come back for you. Um, good question from uh, Teresa Kleccia. Um, How does Quantum maintain its commitment to site-specific theater in this space? That's an interesting question, Teresa. Hi. <laughs> Hi there. Um, yep. You know, it, it means uh, it's a very site specific is open ended to me. This felt very site specific. It, it honored this place that is important to quantum and has been for decades, which is this warehouse where our entire stock of stuff lives. We were surrounded by the history of quantum theater. Mm -hmm. We made it safe. We made it habitable. And I would argue that with the genius of Kelsey Garrett, there she is, we made three distinct environments in that safe warehouse. It was a marvelous place to work. It was all about sight for us, you know, really was. And that was part of my question was sort of, you know, you call, you, you describe it as a film, it's also theater, but it's, it's gotta be quantum too, right? So there were things about it where recognizably to me, you were in some specific space that was not a built purpose set, right? Mm -hmm. And some, sometimes you shifted to things that felt more, more that way. And that to me made things, it made it more interesting to me to look at it immediately, think of myself sitting in your warehouse. Thank you so much for acknowledging that. And there were interesting steps along the journey. I mean, we clearly built Harper's house to begin with. We originally talked about maybe Harper's house becomes, maybe, you know, we, we thought we would film part three in Harper's house, a different version of it, like distressed version of it. But there was a moment where Joe and Mark said, look at this corner of the warehouse because of the light because of these windows with this light streaming through. And to me, it felt like the wasteland, you know, T.S. Eliot. And, and it was so bleak just from the light. So we took a leap of faith that our genius designer, Kelsey Garrett, would be able to work with that. And we knew that you would see that we were not outside, we were inside, that there was a ceiling at some point. Mark's shots absolutely did not try to disguise anything. In between that, the warehouse itself really stood in for a hat factory. You know, it, it really looked like a hat factory well because Susan dressed it unbelievably, right? You know, she provided real millinery stuff and Kelsey beautifully, you know, worked with that to make it a hat factory. Anyway, it was a fascinating environmental journey unlike any other of Quantum's. I'll jump in. John, and, you want to go? Oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Just real quick. What's interesting, um, that first set, which is the most set um, of them all, was actually the set from Wild, the previous live stream production that we flipped and turned into. So in very much, it was using sites and repurposing them into, into this story and these in particular environments. Kelsey designed Wild, night and day. <laughs> John, do you want to go ahead and uh, ask your question? Yeah, sure, I'd love to. Um, so first of all, just a huge congratulations to everyone involved. I mean, I, I know, yeah, <laughs> times are tough and creating stuff and finding the energy to push forward and, and to accept the world as it is and to 
and to put stuff out in there uh, is uh, kind of a terrifying, but also exhilarating thing to do. Uh, so I hope you all had, I mean, it sounds like you all had a blast doing it. And again, huge congratulations. Uh, so that's amazing. I, I just watched it um, prior to hopping on this. Uh, so it's pretty good and fresh in my mind. Um, my question is a bit of a, probably going to be a bit of a word salad question around um, genre and medium. So I'll try to make it coherent. Um, but, you know, something that I was kind of thinking of is I'd seen some quantum productions before and, you know, it, the one of the things I've loved the most about it is the site specificity and the physicality of, of the past productions that I have seen. Um, but obviously, you know, this is filmed and then streamed. And yet it, 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 at the same time, it, it was clearly retaining elements of a almost like a, a like a play format, kind of like when you see a kind of like when you see a play like Glenn Gary against Glenn Ross adapted to a movie, right? But you, it, it has that, it has a certain language to it that makes it still like a play adaptation rather than something you would necessarily just call like, oh, I watched this movie, it, you know what I mean? And so in a, in a way, my question almost doesn't matter because I think in some ways, medium and genre fall away to whatever impact the thing has emotionally for you or what you take away from it, regardless of how you kind of define or quantify it. But I'm also just curious, you know, how much thoughts around, you know, what is this thing that we are creating? And, and did you kind of come to a definition of what you were creating? And did that drive how you approached it in any way or not? Um, or anything around kind of those topics? Yeah. Uh, well, one thing I wanted to I'll say about that, um, there was a decision that was made um, really from the get go that um, this is sort of going back to something that Carter um, was talking about earlier, um, you know, not to nail it down the way you might do in a movie with the camera is on a tripod here, then it goes over here, then it goes here, and then we do wide, medium, close, reverse, master, blah, blah, blah. Um, the, the, the decision was made um, because we have a, a good director of photography um, to that, but there was some risk involved uh, in, in being fluid with the camera. And the camera, in a way, I think, you know, as a participant or, a, you know, and a participant observer on the set, you know, in addition to the actors, there was one other person that was on the set. None of us were really on the set unless we had to be. And that was Mark. But the idea that the camera would, um, in a way, do this dance with the performance. Um, I think was a really key to coming up with what we came up with, not just the key. I mean, it was, it was absolutely the only way to do it. And um, I think that was the key to, to my mind. It's a key to its, um, to its success is that um, uh, there is this kind of um, playfulness and this kind of um, easiness about um, what the audience sees and how they see it that really makes it work in a very in a wonderful way that's that's my opinion i don't know what anyone else feels yeah and i'd also say that like throughout the experience of it uh carla definitely sort of kept reminding us this is theater let's do theater let's create some theater <laughs> let's release ourselves from um you know the camera and all the expectations or boxes or uh, traps that may come within that but instead just embrace what it is and give a full uh throated swing at it i didn't know what those boxes were so <laughs> you know hey Stuart, this is shelly can i jump in there can, can i just say yeah. when everybody's talking about theater what i loved is when i sat down and started watching it I felt like I was at a quantum show, you know, I felt like, you know, I had missed being at quantum shows and it plays so much. So uh, what you're saying, like I felt the sense of being at a play. I've described the show as Cormac McCarthy's The Road Meets the Hunger Games. So I, I thought it was a little bit of that, you know, post-apocalyptic um, kind of genre. But anyway, I also just want to thank everybody for putting it together and I loved it. But I will also say it makes me look forward to when we can all be together again and not looking at each other on a screen. But I thought it was fabulous and congratulations to all of you. Thanks, Shelley. 
a uh, couple questions from the chat. Um, one of them, uh, Jim Schneider asked how many days of shooting. Um, well, we had like 20 days set aside. Um, you guys could talk to the process briefly. You rehearsed for some days and were kind of lining up shots, right? And then there were, you know, towards the end of the week you were doing the shooting is how it worked out. Is that right? There were seven shooting days, um, two days per, well, we, you know, we, we three acts or three sets, right? And then, and then one day for um, filming everyone in their hat in their hats. But it wasn't like these two arrived for the shooting days. They were there for every minute of every re rehearsal. Um, and that was a beautiful aspect of the work. That's how we all felt like we were doing one thing all together somehow from our different perspectives, that we were all there all the time. So was Kelsey, you know, so was Susan on the Zoom. Everyone was there all the time. That's a quantum value in terms of a design team. And it played out in its, its, its own way in this project. Um, Bill Davies was wondering where the warehouse is. It's on Manchester on this uh, Detroit switch building. And we share it actually with our, our wonderful friends at Attack Theater. Michelle um, was saying how interesting it was to see the warehouse transformed, you know, because that's a space that, that you know, is, is ours and um, Bricolage has some space in there with us as well. So it's become this like nice little artistic home for us in, in Manchester and this is really crucial. Shout out to our landlord, Detroit Switch, marvelous people who mm -hmm. enable artists in, in this warehouse where they do their, you know, commercial business. They're so good to us. Yeah. Even when we do things like get the freight elevators, you know, they're just very accommodating and good friends to us. A um, couple questions from uh, uh, Shappy, Stu Shapiro. Um, he said, I'll hit, hit both of them. Um, he loved the show and the way it was filmed, but it was short. Was it cut down at all? And then Sartre is not here, who um, was our sound designer, did a lot of the composition, but maybe somebody else can speak to this. He said the music was very inspiring and is wondering, you know, where Sartya drew inspiration from. So I'll kick both those two together. Well, the the um, we every word was the play, no no more, no less, right? Uh, Joe and I had both seen it. Probably others in our team had seen it, but I saw it in London in in two thousand in its opening run, and he saw it in New York when the London production came to New York. So we did Carol Churchill's play, start to finish, no more, no less. Um, Sartya is a wonderful contributor to our team. Maybe Joe, would you like to talk about, you work so closely with her. Sartya Pickett, sound designer and composer. Well, she was involved right from the very beginning. I mean, she's just immensely a uh, talented uh, person who um, was able to tune into the whole vibe of, of, of what it, of the, the sound of the environments and what the musical elements could be. And uh, in addition to contributing to the look of the, um, particularly, I remember the, the last set and provided some interesting imagery uh, about that and was just very engaged from the beginning. She also recorded all of the location sound, which is pretty challenging. Uh, it's not a sound stage over there. It's, you know, there's a there's the off ramp from uh, Ohio River Boulevard right out the window and uh, various environmental um, hums and buzzes and so on. And she was uh, super on top of all of that. Sounds um, like right a quantum there. show. What's that? Sounds like a quantum show. Yeah, it was. <laughs> a, yeah. Um, but she, uh, you have to, I cannot tell you where uh, where her ideas came from, but she not only is very, um, uh, she was right on with everything, but also very fast and very focused and very precise. And it really made the whole final edit of this possible um, because she was just um, working it all so beautifully. And we were just shooting things back and forth on Dropbox, you know, overnight and back and forth and getting it all put together so that it could run on the 19th of February. And um, she's just a remarkable person. It was very effective, really effective. From the, from the first note. Mm -hmm. um, 
such one a, last, can an I... amazing um, composer. And I had a chance to talk with her about some of the choices that she made. And, you know, she made choices for specific birds um, that, that um, moved her. Um, and, and she incorporated ravens into the sound. And for the hat factory, this, is, this was an example of something that was really fun. I had brought in a bunch of pictures from the Stat Stackpole Hat Factory in London um, for everybody to look at. And it, surprisingly, there were a lot of machines. Um, so Sarcha asked me if I would send her extra photos and she co incorporated what she thought the sounds of those machines uh, working would be. So there are very soft sounds of sewing machines and steam um, and, you know, taken from other conversations that the whole team had had. Hey, I'm just moved to throw in that there's an artist also that we haven't talked about uh, that I want to shout out to, and that is Sydney Asselin, a fantastic lighting designer who isn't on the Zoom, I think, tonight, but the other amazing contributor to our group. Small, we're a small number of people and every single person was so crucial and it was, it was so holistic the way we worked together it was wonderful. Um, Donald, I see your hand raised again. I'm just working through um, some of the questions in the, in the chat, um, but I'll come back for you in just a second. Um, question from Evan Riley. Um, I have a question for the designers. Uh, what challenges were faced in creating a dystopian world? Kelsey, you begin. Ooh, where to begin? <laughs> I, I think that was probably our problem um, because there, there's so many options. Um, and trying to decide first on the, the time period that each of these individual acts take place and if we needed to and was the third act in the future or was that tomorrow or right now? Um, so we, yeah, it was such an open-ended conversation because it really could be anything. Churchill's so sparse and so full of metaphor that um, there's really no indication um, or stage direction given to us. So I think we tossed around several ideas, but it really started to come together when we looked at that corner and there was this void and there was this vastness um, that was searing and felt so harsh and unprotected in this feat. So this feeling of um, what happens when these people are trying to hold on to their sense of reality, but it's just being stripped away from them. And there's no, there's no real cover. There's no real shield from these events that are happening. So that's ultimately where we landed. I don't know if that speaks to everything. It was a long process getting there. You know, interestingly, Evan, it uh, didn't feel so dystopian after all. I think it probably was when Carol Churchill wrote it in 2000, but so much of um, what she describes seemed to me to be uh, right in the midst of my imagination, um, you know, for today. Um, there were some painters that really um, affected me um, in terms of the psychological state of mind for the actors um, that I kept in mind. And, uh, the, you know, it was interesting because at the very beginning I felt that um, act one was in the past, act two felt like the present and act three would be the future. But we, we kept it tight um, and uh, uh, possibly recognizable for today. So, um, Carla kept us really, you know, thinking about um, that along the way too. So for me, it wasn't completely dystopian, although there was a picture taken by Robert Wilson, the photographer, not Robert Wilson, the director, um, of a bunch of soldiers in the UK that were uh, uh, coming back from battle. Uh, and that figured in pretty heavily for me for Act Three. I have kind of a related question that I'll piggyback on here. Uh, Maureen asks, uh, could you talk about the motivation inspiration that informed the parade of hats or traitors? And, um, you know, something I'll kick out that, you know, was shared with me was um, 
those research photos from the Cultural Revolution and you know the the hats that you know were part of um, uh, the 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 trials that happened there. But um, yeah, do you want to speak more about the the hat parade sequence? Um, I could say something about it. Um, uh, there was a we couldn't film a parade because of COVID, so. Um, that left us with um, the challenge of having these extraordinary hats, 28 of them, um, and six people to wear them, and trying to figure out how to do that uh, in an environment where people have to stay 20 feet apart and be filmed you know, individually, separately. So um, as a sort of problem solving exercise, um, it seemed to make more sense that although there could be some marching toward something that they would end up in the space where you could see everybody in that these jumbotron um, screens um, around the building would provide close ups of hats and you would sort of get to see sort of everything at once in a way that might not be possible if everyone was sort of marching along in a line, which would have required a big studio green screen, which we didn't have. So there is that aspect to it. But then there's also these, um, uh, so I started thinking about these game shows and you know, like America's Got Talent and um, that kind of thing. And it seemed like th this was an interesting environment to put the hat parade in a kind of a very perverse version of that. Cause these shows are, have, you know, if you think of Fear Factor and those kinds of shows, there are sadistic elements to them. And I thought, well, that's an interesting way to go. But so that, anyway, that's one thought about it. But um, uh, Susan, you may have others about how, uh, I don't know, how this could, t you know, the challenge was to figure out how to do this uh, when you couldn't do a parade, really. Yeah. Talk about making us be prisoners, how, how deep that was. You know, it's, uh, humanity has done pretty, terrible things um, to other humans. Humans do terrible things. And uh, the fact that we were dealing with a society that was supposedly rewarding prisoners going off to their death with brand new, fabulous, outrageous hats was pretty strange and, and kind of awful. And that um, the folks in the hat factory, the characters that um, Carol Churchill wrote, were, were kind of, uh, they, they were in that. They had accepted it. It was a way of life. It was now a concept. And this is something that has struck me um, from the first day there was a shooting in a school, that now it was a concept that children could shoot children. Um, and for me, um, the, the world of Carol Churchill is a very heavy world, but a very realistic world, unfortunately. Um, I, yeah, I think I'll stop talking here because I'll just get everybody really depressed. <laughs> but I, you know, the thing that, well, I will say one thing, the, the brilliant thing about Churchill is that she lifts horrifying things out of 100% reality. And, and puts it into this kind of strangeness. This is the thing I love about her writing. She lifts um, facts and, and puts them into another realm so that we, we step back and we, we really look uh, with a different mind and head and it's sort of Brechtian and it's really interesting. Yeah, I love Teresa's well, cool. just put in speaking to the styling of the different dystopias in the beach act. Yeah, I, I like that a lot too. The three different three different acts is three different dystopias, Margaret Atwood, George Orwell, and Samuel Beckett. I love that take. Um, Donald and Sons. That's a great segue because actually, as my other son, uh, Paris, uh, had the question, but I just want to say, watching this together last night uh we we must have been we talked at least a couple hours and there's all kinds of discussion uh, about you know what does this mean what does that mean and 
and just a wonderful and intimate uh, production. Uh, thank you very much for it. Um, go ahead, Paris. Um, whenever the, the workers at the hat factory um, talked about eating somewhere for lunch, they talk, uh, he, uh, he said that there was a cafe that they didn't go to. Why was that? Why do you think? I do not know. <laughs> I think there's a lot of possibilities out there. Um, and I think probably your greatest suspicions are probably right on. Um, I don't think there's a right answer. I don't think there's a wrong answer. Um, and I think the fact that you're asking the question about what is out there in the world, in that world, um, is exactly probably what Carol Churchill would want you to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's I, I always thought of act two or scene two as a meet cute. If it were in any other situation, we wouldn't go, oh, this is dark until we begin. I mean, when you get to the trials, then I go, something's going on there. Well, we already know from the first scene that it is, but if it were just scene two, there's a sprightliness and a sense of fun to their relationship that I think is, I don't want to say restful, but a great change of pace for one and three. So we've been going for about 45 minutes, which is the length of our, our film. So I want to take a couple more questions and then I think, um, you know, give give chance for me like a little, little closing comment here. So um, <laughs> Richard asks, if there's any ability to talk of submitting the work to film festivals, um, you know, somebody else had the idea to ask us, you know, you know, is this something that, you know, WQED could, could air and, uh, you know, we're certainly interested to learn more and find out, you know, the future we're used to working with the actors union and, you know, actors equity and there's different things with this license holders as with SAG. So it's something we're interested in. We love this piece. But, you know, from my perspective, I'll also say that we're really excited to get back to, to live in-person work this summer. And that's where a lot of our attention is focused. Of course, but it's so strange that it exists fixed we can revisit it. That's not like anything I've made in 30 years. It's not like an archival um, recording of a show that we did. No, it's nothing like that. So it's wonderful that it exists. And yeah, we are interested in showing it again. We're interested in, I don't know, you know, everything from uh, it's, it's late spring and we can put it up on the side of a building and people can see it outside and share the experience together to kind of lean into that. It's really theater part of it. Um, I, I, I'm so glad that it exists as a thing that can be revisited for all of us. Thanks for asking that, Richard. But yes, I'll we'll say that making live theater, Stuart. <laughs> But as somebody's an expert in the future life of projects like this, reach out to me because it is something we are also interested in. All right, I think that anybody have any last questions or last comments, reactions they want to share while we're all together? Mark. Mm. I'm mute. Um, I just want to say from the point of view of a, uh, a photographer, um, this, this experience started with a script, which made no sense to me. I, I was like, is there some under the bed that I, I mean, I didn't have the imagination to see what the team, the quantum team would bring to this. 
And I, I it just, uh, I, I'm just like, just totally gobsmacked about what this turned into and the things that were uh, put before the camera for me to, to shoot, which is the easiest thing in the world as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Being modest. He shot what? it so wonderfully. <laughs> I mean, it was it was a, just a terrific, terrific experience, and I'm just humbled by the the whole process. And 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 to see that oh, I, I was uh, you know entered into this team who had worked you know working with each other and, and people and uh, putting incredible amounts of energy into things. And uh, and uh, just just one moment that I remembered uh, was when it went live. People looking at each other was like. Well, I guess this is opening night. <laughs> Not a normal opening night. <laughs> um, so they gave me a bit of a pang. But anyway, I, I, I'm very lucky and thank everybody very much. Thank you. We thank you, Mark. You made us all look good. Yes, you did, and you were very. There was a lot of. It takes a lot of guts to get in there handheld and not get all freaked out about if something isn't exactly this or that. And it just, it, it was a. It, it turned out beautifully, in large part thanks to your camera work. Yeah. Well, Stuart, final word just is. Huge thanks to everybody for watching it. You know, we did this, we want eyes on it. Please, please, please write to one person and say, watch it in the next four days. <laughs> please do that for us. <laughs> yeah, I mean, your recommendation means more than anything we can push out there. So yeah, please do. Thanks all of you for coming to talk with us tonight and thank you wonderful people who made this show. Uh, so, it's beautiful so work. good to see you. Thank you, you look good. <laughs> You're there. <laughs> Have a great night, everybody. Bye, everybody. Wonderful to see everybody. Bye. Thanks for coming. Gone. <laughs>